Hello from the Tick Fund. I'm Mayor Soloveitchik, and I'm delighted to be joined for the latest in my series of short conversations on what Jerusalem means to me by Ben Shapiro. Ben, thank you so much for making the time today. And thanks for having me. It's great to speak with you. Uh, I thought we'd begin our conversation uh, with uh, a fascinating uh, piece of uh, writing that you gave us uh, at the moment when the American embassy was moved to Jerusalem. And uh, what you wrote is that uh, this move highlighted how, and I'm paraphrasing you, how Israel isn't a new outpost of the West. It's the oldest center of the West. And you added that the embassy moving to Jerusalem was a recognition that the West was founded on Jerusalem rather than the other way around. That, that's really a fascinating sentence. I thought maybe I'd begin by asking you to expand on that. Sure. So I, I think that one of the perceptions that has become very widespread on the political left, unfortunately, and also is promulgated by people who wish Israel not to exist as, a, as an independent polity, right, is the idea that, that basically Israel is established as a colonialist outpost in the Middle East by foreigners. And that, of course, is a lie. The, the reality is that Israel is the wellspring of the West. It is the oldest beginning of the West. Central principles of Western thought begin in Jerusalem, begin with the, the foundation of Judaism and the promulgation of Judaism from its center in Jerusalem, uh, those, those foundations include things like the idea that the universe actually is a cognizable place where you're able to use the human mind to, to discover eternal truths about the way that the world works, the idea that history has a direction, that it's not just merely circular, the, the idea that the human mind is capable not only of reflecting what the universe is saying to it, but is capable of, of, of searching beyond itself, uh, and that there is a moral relationship between the things that you do and the outcomes that exist in the real world. All of these are Judaic concepts that then end up being promulgated largely via Christianity to a far broader audience over time. And it's that balance between Jerusalem, those core ideas, that, that there is an intelligible universe that human beings are capable of understanding because God created us in his own image, uh, and the idea that history has a direction and that that we are that progress exists in the world. These ideas combined with sort of Greek rationality, the, the dual poles of Jerusalem and Athens, as Leo Strauss suggested, are, are the, the basis of the development of Western civilization. And so the, the notion that Jerusalem was predominantly important to humanity because of its religious beginnings is, is not only historically true, it's also ideologically true and, and reminds people of why it should continue to be important today. It's, it's not some sort of foreign imposition on, for example, Muslim or Arab territory. That's, that's, that's historically and ideologically inaccurate. Right. Uh, you wrote a book where you wrote, where you describe the significance of both Jerusalem and Athens and how the combination uh, of the two cities uh, gave us uh, the achievements of the West. Uh, I'm wondering uh, how would you describe uh, the tensions uh, between uh, Jerusalem and Athens. The city of Athens, of course, uh, did give us, of course, uh, rationality, uh, at least to some extent comes from Athens, uh, philosophy, architecture, art, uh, but it was also a center of uh, uh, paganism and uh, a denial of some of the very concepts that Jerusalem gave to the world. Uh, so uh, how would you describe the, the tension uh, in between uh, them and uh, how uh, the West was produced by, uh, I suppose, selecting uh, from the two or melding the two and synthesizing the two? Uh, on a sort of broad level, I think that the, the easiest way to sort of understand the difference between the Jerusalem and Athens is that Jerusalem is based on the notion that there are certain there are certain truths that are outside the human mind, but that you have to take as the basis for all future development, right? This is the idea of revelation, uh, which is obviously central to Judaism and central to all religion, is the idea that there are certain premises that have to be used for any sort of ideological or intellectual development. And those are some of the things that I was talking about before. It, you, can, it, right. it, you have to actually just assume. There's no way to prove that, for example, the things that we think about the universe are true, that two plus two is four outside of the realm of your own brain. There's nothing in evolutionary biology that suggests that such a truth exists because evolutionary biology is about evolutionary fitness. Right. And so the, 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 you have to just accept that we're working within that framework in order to move forward. What, what Jerusalem, you know, the, the shortcoming of Jerusalem, historically speaking, is that you can become hemmed in by accepted wisdom and accepted knowledge of the past without the capacity to further develop that. And, and I think that if you look within Judaism specifically, the oral law is an attempt to merge human wisdom with, in, in a sort of common law fashion with the, the premises that are, that are handed down on Sinai. 
Greece, on, on a broader level, represents the rationality of human beings brought to bear on these premises. Now, the, the, the mutual threat that they pose to one another is that if you are a pure rationalist, then you can have your rationalism attack the very premises upon which all progress is based. And you see this right now in the West as, as sort of post-Enlightenment thinking takes the fore, where all of the premises of the Enlightenment themselves are now being called into question. Rationalism is sort of eating itself because there is no respect for accepted tradition and accepted wisdom of the past. On the other hand, you can see how religion falls into theocracy when the idea is you can't apply human wisdom to diktats of the past. There is no development. What we have is the way that it's always been, and therefore it can't change in any way. And so it's always that tension and that balance that allows for progress uh, among humans. You can't let go of the the poles that tie you to earth, and that would be Jerusalem. But at the same time, you can't let go of rationality or you're never going to become airborne. Right, so let's apply that to what's actually happening in the West today or threatening the West today. Uh, would you describe this, uh, what's happening, uh, as uh, an extreme rationalism uh, unfettered by faith, or is this more uh, a neo-paganism and, and a return to uh, some of the worst aspects of, of Athens uh, without, without the better ones? And was, uh, there was, a, I recall, uh, there was an article by Christopher Hitchens uh, who wrote, who not a huge fan of Judaism in general, but who wrote about how his least favorite Jewish holiday was Hanukkah, because if only the Jews had lost Hanukkah, there wouldn't be no Jerusalem, there would only be Athens, and we would only have all that was great about Hellenism. Now, of course, the response to that, as you've just described, is that without Hanukkah, the world would not have the biblical concepts of the inviolability of, uh, of human life, a God who is outside the universe and who creates us in his image, and which, and which is the foundation of both the inviolability of human life and also the freedom that is at the heart of man's moral capacity. So uh, the question is, is perhaps what we're facing today less a, a Jungian atheistic extreme rationalism and more of uh, a return to uh, uh, a paganism or a neo-paganism that is shorn of the achievements of Jerusalem. How, how do you see? So I think I think one sort of co collapses into the other. So mm -hmm. I, I think that you, you see thinkers like Stephen Pinker, right? He's a very pro-Enlightenment thinker, right? He wrote right. an entire book about how wonderful the Enlightenment is. And the, the problem is that the Enlightenment is rooted in Judeo-Christian fundamentals, and he fails to recognize that. He so, somehow seems to think, Sam Harris thinks the same thing, that if you apply atheistic rationality to the world, what you end up with is something that looks very much like a sort of Judeo-Christian ethic with regard to the inviolability of human beings and 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 how we ought to treat one another. Uh, I, I remember having this exact conversation with Sam where, where we were talking about how you know we formulated our values. And I said, you know, what's weird, Sam, is that you and I share probably 90% of our values, and yet we come at this from diametrically opposed viewpoints with regard to religion. Why do you think that is? He said, well, you know, I've, I've thought it through, and I've been rationalistic, and I've, I've tried Buddhism. And, and I said, well, yeah, but I, I can't say that I've done all the same things that you have. I would suggest the reason that we share so much is because we both grew up about five miles from each other in North Hollywood in California in the mid-2000s. And so that that probably has more to do with we're living on the fumes of a Judeo-Christian culture that, that was then combined with the Enlightenment to bring us these values then your sort of pure rationalistic perspective that any person put on the moon at any given time comes up with these values just, just by themselves. I think what, what the, the last century has shown is that when you unmoor rationalism from the premises that you require in Jerusalem, you float off into space. And what, that, what happens is that rationalism eats itself. People will say, okay, well, you know, we'll, we'll apply rationalism to those fundamental principles. Okay, so are human beings rational or are they actually just a bundle of firing neurons and raging hormones? And so rationality itself is a construct. Is it possible that the systems of liberty are actually power constructs that are designed in order to foment the excesses of one group against another group? And so maybe the only way for us to live is to get rid of rationality as a concept itself. It's almost, when you talk about kind of the history of how people have viewed rationality over the course of the last 150 years, it looks a lot like Oedipus Rex. It's like people who, who you know, we're going to go after the truth, we're going to go after the truth, and then finally they see the truth and they have to rip out their own eyes. And that that's that's, I think, the danger of, again, a rationalism that refuses to acknowledge that it can't prove its own premises. I mean, this is something that Wittgenstein suggested, right? right? That, I that, guess my question that, is, and this is just one final thought on this, whether it's, it's more that we're just innately um, meaning-seeking creatures, that's how God created us. And if you remove the actual meaning that Jerusalem provides us, a God outside the universe, well, then we'll fill it with something else. In other words, it's not only rationalism turning on itself, it's that, well, if divinity exists 
does not exist outside the universe, then it must be that nature is divine. And whether we'll say that or not, we'll act as if nature is divine. And, and uh, if the moral framework that the Bible gives us is not true, then we'll need some other moral framework and we'll turn something else into mitzvahs and so forth. And was, that is what happened. Is that, that is what's happening, is it not? I mean, no, no question. I mean, yeah. there are alternative forms of religion that have been formulated. You know, the, the yeah. new atheism is one form of that religion that I think right. tends to collapse into neo-paganism. And then Which has its own dogma. Go direct to the and, neo-paganism, yeah. skipping the rationalism, right? Yeah. You don't even need the middle step. You can just go straight from, I don't like religion, I don't like its premises, so I'm going to do religious hedonism, which I think is now the, re the religion effectively of much of the West. Right. So let's talk about the, 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 the opposite but complementary aspect, I think, of, of this, which is that even as uh, uh, a hatred for all that Jerusalem gave the world has led today to attacks on the Jewishness of Jerusalem, we also see a, a remarkable embrace by many believing believing non-Jews uh, of the Jewishness of Jerusalem. And I wonder if that's, uh, do you think that's based on not only the role that the Bible plays in their own lives, but also a sense that in today's age, uh, and in an age where much of the West, as you described, is eating itself, and has sought to amputate Jerusalem from its identity, perhaps for these Christians in America and around the world, um, Jerusalem stands, Jewish Jerusalem stands as a sort of a bulwark or, or beacon for all that they believe. And that's actually fueling their faith as well as their embrace of Jewish Jerusalem. I mean, I think that's entirely true. I mean, I, I speak to religious Christians on an extraordinarily yeah. regular basis. I mean, most of the people who work with me and for me and most of my audience, I'm sure, are people who go to church regularly. Yeah. And when I talk to them, they're, they're folks who believe that Jerusalem and its, and its Jewish identity are the root of the tree. And you can't understand where you are on the tree without having roots that are connected to the ground. Right. And so that requires actually looking at Jerusalem in its historic context, recognizing, for example, if you're a Christian, that Jesus was a Jew, living a Jewish lifestyle in Jewish Jerusalem. Right? This is something that, that you're starting to see people really connect with. You know, when I recently was in Israel, I brought my producers, and my producers are walking around Israel. They're going to sites that, that Jesus walked on, and, and they're realizing that the roots that you know, people really don't spend a lot of time thinking about go extraordinarily deep. I mean, when you live in the United States and it's the most prosperous and powerful country in the history of the world, history only goes about 350, 400 years deep here. Right. And then the most historic site that you're going to see, you're going to Plymouth Rock. Yeah. And that, that's a site that's about 400 years old. And then you go to Israel and probably the newest thing you're seeing is about 400 years yeah. old. Yeah. Right? If you're walking around in old Jerusalem, it, it, every single thing that you are seeing is a thousand years old. Yeah. I mean, you can't sink a spade in, in anywhere in the environs of Jerusalem without digging up a, a piece of, of pottery that's 2,000 years old. Yeah. And when you realize that you are, are not just standing on the shoulders of people who were making policy in 1600, you're standing on the shoulders of those people and they're standing on shoulders yeah. and you have to go you know, 25 generations deep, 40 generations. When, when, when you see that, that I think changes your perspective on, on the amount of gratitude you should have toward your own civilization and also causes you to reinvestigate the roots of the civilization that's, that's brought you the iPhone, for example. Yeah, 100%. You actually just reminded me of one of my favorite jokes of describing how Americans approach history uh, just because of the newness of their own country and describes two Americans touring uh, England, I think. Yeah. And uh, they go to uh, Runnymede and the guide says, it was here at Runnymede that uh, that uh, King John was first forced by the nobles to sign the, Ma the Magna Carta, the, an essential document of the rights of man. And the Americans ask, when was this document signed? And the guy says, 1215. And one of the Americans says to the other, he says, it's 1230 now. If we were here more, just a little bit sooner, we could have, we could have been here for it. <laughs> so um, so I, it is, of course, the, the, the antiquity of Jerusalem, but also, as you say, the continuity uh, of Jerusalem that is, that is so important for them to experience. And uh, you yourself just went back to Jerusalem. You were just there. Um, and the last time you went was a couple of years ago. Is I think is that right? Uh, yeah, 2019 before okay. COVID. So before in the in the in the before time in the long long ago is when you went. So maybe just speak a little bit about uh, the experience of being back and uh, how that impacted I mean, you. It, it's it's an unbelievable thing. So I I think that the most you know telling experience for me uh, was that I was able to go up on Harbait on, on the Temple Mount on Tisha B'Av, uh, and I've done Tisha B'Av never in Israel. I've done Tisha B'Av always in the United States, and it's always you know. To, to me, I have a very hard time sort of, I would say, generating feeling about things that I haven't personally experienced. I know this is something a lot of people have with yeah. regard to prayer, but but for me, when when you're supposed to be sitting and weeping over the temple, that's a very difficult thing for me sitting in, for most of my life, Los Angeles or now sitting in Florida. Right. Being in Jerusalem for Tisha B'Av was such a different thing. And it was a different thing because not only are you looking at the actual stones, 
of the of the second temple in some cases when you go up on on the temple mountain so it feels very real what you realize is that the the sort of Jewish idea that Tisha B'Av eventually is going to be a Chag, that eventually it's not going to be a fast day, it's going to be a day yeah. of celebration. It feels five minutes away. And that's that's the thing that, that really is stunning. You know, when, when Jeremiah talks about how the city is empty and desolate and there's no one here and, and all of the stones have been uprooted and all of this, and then you go to Jerusalem and it's a city of a million people and over 600,000 Jews. And when you walk up onto the Temple Mount, and that day 2,000 Jews went up onto the Temple Mount, it really feels, as I said at the time, this is Rish Yitzmichak Latenu, right? right? This is the first flowering of our redemption. And to not feel that way is, is nearly impossible in that context. And to walk through Jerusalem is to feel as though you're living in a messianic age. Because the, the amazing thing about Jerusalem, as you mentioned, is that it's not just that you're walking through antiquity. It's that you walk directly from antiquity and within one block you're in modernity. And that's the story of civilization. You're walking directly outside the old city and you walk directly into Mamilla, right? <laughs> you walk from the, from the Jaffa it's Gate a bridge. directly into a modern mall. Just by crossing with the, the, the Jaffa Gate, you cross 2,000 years, basically. Right, exactly. You, you, you're, you're fast forwarding through history. And that, that street that you crossed is most of Western history. Right. And, the, and the juxtaposition of the two is a great reminder that one is an outgrowth of the other. So you mentioned your visit to Harabaya to the Temple Mount uh, and... Uh, I was recently there as well, and I had the incredible experience of of, of davening shachris, of engage, of joining a minyan, a, a Jewish prayer quorum. Uh, ah, so you invaded, morning, invaded the Temple Mount. Four yeah. morning, exactly. I, occup, I occupied the Temple Mount, uh, and uh, and I think you also you had mincha there when you were there. Is that is that? Yeah, right? so I went twice. I, I went yeah. I went once uh, earlier in the trip, and then I went once up on Tisha B'Av, which so, was kind of midday. Yeah. So on the one hand, uh, given the quote unquote status quo, uh, this. This is something that I couldn't have even imagined the second time I'd been up there, and and I, it was something I couldn't have even imagined doing ten years ago, uh, and it shows how much things have changed already. On the other hand, to speak both about all that's miraculously been achieved and yet not yet been achieved, uh, and that we still mourn on Tisha B'av, fact remains. And I want to before I say this, I want to emphasize that I fully embrace everything you just said about the mira- about the miraculous nature of all that's already occurred. It is somewhat striking that in Jerusalem, the only religious group, the only faith community that does not have the right to pray uh, freely uh, at their holiest site uh, are the Jews. So given that strangeness, I, I wonder, what you think, what what was going through your mind in general about- Yeah, I mean, it makes the morning morning very real, for sure. I mean, when when you go up there and there's an agent of the Islamic walk who literally just stares at you to make sure that you're not shuckling, right? That you're not- And you can pray, but you can't wear tefillin, right? You can't- You you can't wear tefillin. You can't even bring a sitter. You know. When, when I was up there in 2019, actually, somebody got arrested for the great sin of it was Hoshana Raba, and they took a, they took a Rav vote out of their coat, and they hit them on the Temple Mount yeah. uh, can't have ceremonially. A and, and, yeah. and you can't do that. You can't have leaves yeah. on the Temple Mount. You can't hit them on some rock on the yeah. Temple Mount. That's that's a real problem. You know, th- that feeling, obviously, it, I'll tell you the truth. It's very hard for me to have Kavana when I feel like I'm being stared at. Uh, and so <laughs> in a hostile fashion. Uh, it's, it's interesting it, you it, say that because on the one hand, I felt exactly the same way. On the other hand, it was also maybe the greatest dominating of my life. Yeah, exactly. So. I mean, you know, it's both things. It's like you're not you're not going to get to a point on this planet that is any closer to God. And on the other hand, you have somebody who's staring at you very hostily <laughs> to make sure that you know, what you're reading from your cell phone is not Hebrew, that it's actually just, you know, the, the latest news from J-Post or something. Uh, and it's, it, you know, that 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 is very troubling. The truth is, obviously, that it's actually not just Jews that can't pray up there. If you're a Christian and you walk up there with a cross and it's too overt, they will ask you to put it inside your shirt. So right. there is an apartment. But if you're a Christian tourist, you now. could just walk up. It's if you're if you're a Jew and right. you're, you're suspicious. It's a it's no a for, for sure. And, and yeah. but it's the, you know the, the fact is when people talk about Israel being an apartheid state, the, the only place that I'm aware that there is a different law that fully applies to the Jews than to the Arab Israelis, for example, huh. is on the Temple Mount. The temple. And that is a shocking thing. And by the way, the, the sort of casualness with which the, the entire Temple Mount Plaza is treated yeah. by the Islamic Waqf is yeah. rather insane. I mean, the-, yeah. the, the And the, it's described the, as if the entire place is Al-Aqsa. There were even headlines that described you going to pray at Al-Aqsa. I didn't know that you went into the Al-Aqsa Mosque then to pray. That was right, that exactly. Way. I mean, the, the, the whole thing, it, it's, it's very eye-opening. I encourage people to go up there just for the yeah. geopolitical reasons so that you can actually see what's going on up there. I mean, for example, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, there's only one window they break. Every single time there's a riot on the, on the Temple Mount, there's a, because the windows are actually quite beautiful in the Al Aqsa Mosque, like they're they're carved out of out of stone. They broke one of those windows and they throw all of the all of the rocks through that one window because they don't want to break every single window when they're when they're using the Al Aqsa Mosque as a base to to attack Israeli police. If you walk up there, you will see the Jews treating the place with extraordinary care, and then you will see 
antiquities from 2,000 years ago that are literally just cast into corners and covered with blankets uh, by the Islamic yeah. walk. You, you will see kids up there who are playing with kites and soccer balls yeah. in, in the middle of the, of the central uh, Dome of the Rock Plaza. And meanwhile, Jews are treating this with such respect because it was under the, I mean, Jewish tradition holds, that's the Holy of Holies is right under the Dome of the Rock. Yeah. And meanwhile, I see people who are up there, I mean, I've seen it, people who are up there like sipping McDonald's cups and like right putting it down on the on the foundation stone. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that sort of juxtaposition compared to the way the media cover this, which is it's not holy to Jews. It's only holy to Muslims. I mean, the New York Times said this just a couple of weeks ago. They're like, this used to be holy to Jews in antiquity. And it's like, uh, no. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, you have even you have both uh, uh, sometimes even uh, American Jews and prominent Israelis referring to the Western Wall as Judaism's holiest site. Which, yeah, right. It's yeah. just not true. I mean, yeah. the, the Western Wall is a retaining wall. Yeah. I mean, it's not it's not it's not even. Yeah, it's sanctified wall. by it being the site of Jewish longing for the Temple Mount itself. I mean, that's basically what. It's not even the part of the Western Wall that's yeah. closest to the actual Holy Hundred percent, which is right? why I say why going there is so enlightening. So right. let's close, uh, just close this conversation. Again, I'm so grateful for it. Uh, it as I mentioned to you uh, before we started, uh, these conversations are being held to mark the launch of uh, my new daily podcast, Jerusalem 365, uh, which will tell the entire story of Jerusalem uh, over 4,000 years and the Jewish relationship with it. Uh, why do you think it's important for everyone to learn about the history of Yerushalayim? And uh, what would you hope uh, would be uh, gained from and talked about in such a series? Uh, you know, my, my hope is that if people learn about the history of Jerusalem, they understand that they are learning their own history. If you are a member of one of the three major religions, if you are not, if you're a secular person, Jerusalem should be important to you because it's part of the history of the civilization that you not only inhabit, that you are a beneficiary of. Examining your own roots is going to allow you to live a better, more intelligent, and more fulfilled life understanding the gifts that you've been given, and then carrying forward, forward those gifts into the future. Ben, thank you so, so much. Thanks a lot.